Welcome to 3ABN's Fall Camp Meeting, Homecoming 2018. Featuring inspired messages from your 3ABN family and uplifting Christian music. All to prepare your heart for the coming of the Lord. Hello and welcome back to 3ABN's Fall Camp Meeting 2018. I'm so excited to be here with the chairman of our board, Bruce Farley. I'm Jason Bradley. And we have a wonderful panel uh, where they will be ask, answering questions, uh, Bible questions that have been submitted by mm -hmm. some of you and some of the viewers at home. So we have Pastor John Lomacang. We have Pastor C.A. Murray. We have Shelly Quinn, and we have Pastor Ryan Day. Uh, so, and Bruce, are you going to ask our first question? Yeah, it's good to be here with everyone here and everyone at home. Our first question is for the panel, and panel, we got to go quick because we have a lot of questions. Where is it in the Bible written to strengthen your unbelief? Where is it written in the Bible to strengthen your unbelief? In one of the Gospels, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the, the, the problem is that the text doesn't really strengthen your unbelief. Um, someone asks, strengthen my unbelief. Um, I think that's what we're, what we're dealing with. Well, I think the quote is when he said, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Right. Yeah, so... <laughs> I don't think that we That's can Mark strengthen our own belief. That's a Mark 9.24. There we go. Thank you. Mark 9.24. Mark 9.24. And the Bible reads as follows. Here it is, Mark 9.24. I like the fact that you guys right, you guys got right to the question. Yeah, we have a lot of questions. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Mark 9, 24. Yeah, technically, you don't want to strengthen your unbelief. You want to strengthen your belief. So he asked for strength in his belief. He had some faith. He wanted stronger faith. And, you know, we really, um, it is God that works in us to will and to do his good pleasure. So he is the one we want to call on, just as this man did. Lord, help thou my unbelief. But Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So if you want to strengthen your belief, get into the Word of God Amen. and learn to claim His promises and pray them back to Him, and you will not believe how God will work in you to strengthen your belief. Amen. Okay, so now we have uh, a question that says, will there be a secret rapture? No. <laughs> Care to elaborate? As the sun shineth on the east to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Nothing secret about the second coming of the Lord. It will come as a thief in the night. True, but you got to keep on reading. In the which uh, the elements will melt with fervor and heat. So there's nothing secret about the second coming of the Lord. He's not trying to sneak in here. When he comes, we'll all know. The description that comes to my mind when I have, when people ask that question, you know, is, is first of all, I, I rarely have someone call it a secret rapture. I think that's more of something that we've kind of tagged to that because that's essentially the idea that people are communicating. The fact that Jesus is going to come kind of quietly, very suddenly, and, you know, people are going to start vanishing out of nowhere. But, you know, all through the New Testament and even parts of the Old Testament, we have those texts where uh, we are shown the events or the details given to us uh, pertaining to the second coming of Jesus. One of those that stick out to me is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I like to call it the loudest verse in the Bible. This is definitely not a secret rapture or a secret coming at all. For it says here uh, in verse 16, For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a... 
shout with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God. And the, it's going to be so loud and non-secret that it's going to wake the dead up because it says the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. So that's not secret. Uh, to meet the Lord in the air, and thus shall we always be with the Lord. And I always like to read the last verse, verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. It's comforting to know that Jesus isn't going to sneak up on us. He will uh, be known when he arrives. That's and right. I used, I'm sorry. And uh, Psalm 50 and verse 3, speaking about the coming of the Lord, our God shall come and shall not keep silent. That's not only will it not be silent, as pointed out by First Thessalonians, but it says, a fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous all around him. So, you see that if he's coming back, why would the most important event in human history be a silent event? Nothing that happens in humanity. You have the World Series, the whole world knows. You have the NFL championship, everybody knows. The, the presidency, anything that's happening in Congress, the whole world is watching. Why would the king of the universe tiptoe back mm -hmm. when that's the most important event in human history? Yeah. That's right. That has never come quietly. Uh, if you read Luke's Gospel of the First Coming, uh, you've got angels, you've got a star. He's never snuck in, and he says he's not going to sneak in the last time. I'm looking forward to that day. Our next question Aww. is on forgiveness. Does Jesus forgive someone who does not want forgiveness? And part two, this is a twofer, part two is should we forgive someone who does not want forgiveness? First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive. Predicated on confession. Now that's Jesus. We're not quite there yet. So we need to forgive for our own salvation and our own sake. Ellen White says that one of the reasons we don't forgive is because we carry around, she uses the term, a big old bucket of pride. That's why we don't want to forgive, because they did it to me. Mm. And if we can get rid of our pride and be humble as servants, we would find it a little bit easier, a lot easier to forgive. Not forgiving someone is you taking the poison and hoping they die. Okay. And forgiveness really... The first thing about forgiveness is it frees the person who extends the forgiveness. Amen. You know, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And we know we could look back now on his closing life's record and not say that he ended his life with malice or with anger or with hatred. He extended forgiveness to those who didn't even know what they did. And a lot of times the reason why we extend forgiveness is because people don't understand the impact of what they've done on us. Mm -hmm. But the person, as you said, Bruce, thank you for sharing that line, the first person that becomes free is the one that extends the forgiveness. Because to reiterate, you can take poison all your life, and in many cases, matter of fact, in all cases, you'll die before the other person does. And the other thing about that, you'll carry with yourself a burden when other people have mentally and emotionally moved on, and you're carrying burdens. We find people many, many years later. That's why when the Lord uh, was met, by the paralyzed man and his friends brought him to the Lord as they broke open the roof. One of the first things Jesus said, your sins be forgiven you. Because that man's condition was based on something that brought about this need for being forgiven. And the thing that gave him the freedom was the Lord forgave him first, which facilitated the healing that was the next aspect in his experience. So forgiveness leads to not only spiritual wholeness, but physical healing. Amen. Now, here's a question that you hear asked a lot. Is it a sin to be tempted? No, the Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all ways as we are. Mm -hmm. the, the sin, um, you know, it's interesting because when you think of lust, people will call lust a temptation. No, lust is a sin. Jesus said that if you lust after another woman or someone who's not yours, then you've already committed adultery in your heart. The temptation comes, let's say that someone walks in front of you scantily clad. There's a temptation. You've got to turn your eyes away, turn your eyes to Jesus and not let 
lust come into your heart. You know, you've heard the, the saying that you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop them from nesting. And so that is something that the Bible tells us in Hebrews, that he was tempted in all ways as we are, yet without sin. And we've got to hang on to that. Right. The passage that comes to my mind when I ask this question is James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Uh, it actually gives us the clear differentiation between sin and temptation. Verse 14 says, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. I think all of us fall into that category. But notice verse 15. It says, Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So it's not a sin to be tempted. We're all tempted. As she said, Christ was tempted. Mm -hmm. But when we give in to that, when we succumb to those desires and that temptation, then sin is born. Uh, Ryan, include verse 13 because that, that, that gives sure. such a beautiful picture. I think that answers the question directly. Oh, yeah. No, I, I like this. Yeah, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Amen. Amen. So don't converse with your temptations. <laughs> Next question. How do you explain reincarnation? How do, you How do you explain reincarnation? Spiritualism. Okay, go ahead. I was just going to say it's a, it's a form of spiritualism. Um, reincarnation is not biblical. So the quick answer that I would give to someone is that it's not biblical. You can't find one... Uh, text in all the Bible uh, that spells out that, that kind of, of uh, ideology or, or concept. I would just say reincarnation is a myth. I mean, the Bible is very clear that when we die, we sleep, mm -hmm. we don't, we're not awakened till John 5, 28 and 29 when, when Jesus returns, all who are in their graves will hear his voice. Death is a sleep. So reincarnation is a myth. If a man dies, shall he live again? In, in all of the, the ancient languages, all of the ancient cultures, there is something akin to reincarnation. The, the Jews had it. They had this idea that if you lived one way in this life, you'd live the opposite way in the next life. Um, it's, it's a perversion of a, of a Bible truth. The, the truth is we, we will be and I say this advisedly, incarnated, reincarnated at the second coming. But that is a work of God, a work under the, under the auspices of Jesus, not some karma outworking that we do ourselves. Mm. Incarnate means inherent. Uh, Jesus was incarnate God, unborrowed, underived. The incarnation aspect presupposes that there's something in you that never dies. That's why you reincarnate. But there's nothing in humanity that continues to exist after death. And so, the Lord made it very clear. I'll just give you a couple of examples here. In Genesis 3.19, the Lord said to Adam, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Returning to life, another form of life, is not what the Bible supports. Returning to your condition before you were created is what the Bible says. So it's not reincarnation, that's returning. Returning to dust, and you stay there, and you're not, you're not reincarnated by your own inheritance. I know what Pastor C.A. meant. He made a very clear point. The, the life that you experience again comes from the life giver. And the trumpet of God brings that back to life. So when Paul says, you died and your life is hidden with Christ, hidden with Christ in God, he's saying every record of every human life, everybody that ever was born, the record of their existence is kept by God. And I used to think that the one thing I learned, and Elamite made this very clear, uh, we would say, okay, nothing survives death. That's true. There's no soul that continues to go on. You don't live in a different location. And there is no existing afterlife. But the one thing that survives your death is your life record. Mm -hmm. That is what determines which resurrection you're going to be in. Right. Right. And, and, at, and that life record is what Christ keeps. 
Every man shall receive a reward according as his work shall be. Behold, I come quickly, my reward is with me. Your life record continues to go on, mm. and that determines which, which resurrection you're going to be in. Amen. Okay, Shelley, and then we have to move on to yes, the next question. Yes, I just want to add this. Reincarnation presupposes immortality. Mm -hmm. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 6.16, God alone has immortality, who lives in an unapproachable light that no man has seen or can see. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, it tells us when we put on immortality, if you come up in the first resurrection, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 says, we shall not all sleep as in death, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet when Christ returns, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will raise incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. But that happens at the first resurrection. Amen. Okay. Now, how many of you have heard this question asked before? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to bad people? You know, the, shy, the sun shines on the just and the unjust, unjust. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. No one is excluded from the results of sin. And that's the answer to that no one is ex excluded from the results of sin. The difference between those who have not accepted Christ and those who have is the results of sin for us are only temporary, but the benefits of righteousness is eternal. For those who have not accepted Christ, the results of sin are eternal, and the benefits of Christ, the sun and the rain, are temporary. So it happens to all. Uh, Solomon the wise man, speaking about humanity, he says, Death happens to all. The dog, the lion, the human, it all happens to all. But the one thing between the dog and us is we have the promise of eternal life. Amen. I think the presupposition is erroneous. I, Christ said, why callest thou me good? There is none good but the Father which is in heaven. We look at a person's life, they seem to be going well, they, things seem to be going well. We say, oh, that's a good person. But you never really know what's going on inside. Our righteousness is a gift of God through the justification experience. And then, of course, he calls us righteous and then sets about making us what he calls us through the sanctification experience. So who is inherently good? Who inherently has righteousness? No, not one. Mm -hmm. Ryan, you got something? You know, this, when this question is asked, the, the passage that comes to my mind is the parable of the wheat and the tares. Uh, and I uh, just want to read these couple of texts here. It says, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept, notice, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. Now, verse 27 is interesting. It says, So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, when did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And then notice verse 29 here. But he said, uh, no, excuse me. Yep. He says, uh, no, lest while you gather up the tares, uh, excuse me, I lost my spot. Oh, verse 28, I skipped it. He said unto them, and in these few words here, an enemy has done this. An enemy has done this. Verse 27, there's almost like an implied accusation against the character of God there. Uh, you know, sometimes when we, when, when we ask that question, why do bad things happen to good people, we, all, we always want to, you know, also ask the question right along with it, why doesn't God keep it from happening? And truthfully, God was asked that question, hey, Lord, you know, you sowed, didn't you sow good seed? And how did these tares get here? Almost like, did you have something to do with this? Uh, but of course, the answer was an enemy has done this. Yeah, the enemy, we have an enemy, and he wants to destroy us that, absolutely. and keep us from choosing Jesus. Mm -hmm. That almost reminds me of back in, with Adam and Eve. You know, Adam was saying, well, it was the woman that you gave me, you know, trying to blame God. <laughs> what other questions do you have, Bruce? What does the Bible say about cremation? Hmm. I was just whispering to the pastor to see it because the point he made, I, I really grabbed onto it, but I don't know if you caught it. Because he made a point that was really powerful. He said, 
It presupposes that we're good, but there's nobody good. So bad things can't happen to good people. <laughs> there you go. I, I know they didn't get it. <laughs> ain't nobody good. Bad things can't happen to good people because ain't nobody good. Yeah. That's right. So back to our next question. <laughs> There are a couple of examples or texts, and I cannot think of them, I don't know if you all can, of cremation in the Bible. Um, we've done a lot of study on this because my husband and I have determined we will be cremated, and so we wanted to make certain that that was scriptural, but I'm sorry that I can't think of the text. Can you? You know, I, I can't think of a specific text in the Bible that addresses the concept of cremation. The fact that, that, I mean, if there's one, I would love for someone to show me, but um, as far as sure. my knowledge, there's not one that I'm aware of. Um, and so I think it really just is up to the individual, the person, uh, to make that decision. I've no, I know a lot of Christians who try to um, make that sound bad or make others feel bad about making that decision to be cremated um, because it's our tradition here in Western culture, uh, for the most part, to bury the dead in the ground. Again, as Pastor read earlier, unto dust you shall return. Uh, but, you know, I had someone, I had a gentleman one time, he, he kind of stopped me in one of my seminars, and he was rebuking me. How could you tell someone that they can make that decision on their own? They should be buried as we should be buried, unto dust they return. And I brought up the, the point that, you know, there's a lot of people in the Dark Ages that didn't have that choice. They were burned at a stake. And they were martyrs for Jesus, and they gave their life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I don't know how God's going to do it, but I know that he can just speak the word, and that person can appear with a brand new body, That's and they it. will go to heaven. That's your Amen. text. Your text is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And if past is prologue, what he did before, he can do it again. Is it any harder for God to recreate a body that has been burned to ashes or that over the centuries has disappeared through the natural process? If, if God can do one... God can do the other. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Whether you create the ashes or nature creates the ashes, they're still ashes, and God has the power to make something out of nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Excellent answers. Now, people want to know, where is God when I am hurting? Psalm 34. Let's go there. The question is, where are, you, where are you in your attitude about God when you're hurting? That's really the issue. God has often been praised for the blessing and, and blamed for the pain. That's the sad reality. Even among Christians, I, I said to someone, and Pastor Sia talked about this, you know, we go back before the Internet, I've known Pastor Sia. Just kind of give you an idea, and he's known me that long too. But the wow. point I'm making is, yeah, before the Internet, before Al Gore created the Internet, we've known each other. Yeah. <laughs> See all this gray hair he has? Notice I have none. Okay. <laughs> this is called evolution. But what were we talking about? What was the question? Oh, boy. See what happens when you take exits? What was I saying? That's a part of age, Where is too. God when I am? Where is God? God? Psalm 34. Psalm 34. The, one of the reasons why the Lord don't allow some people to go through trials is because they will deny God. Psalm 34. Look what the Bible says. Psalm 34, we're going to start with the verse, verse 17. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears, mm. and delivers them out of how much? All their troubles. Where is the Lord? Verse 18, the Lord is near mm -hmm. to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Mm -hmm. Where is God? Verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Amen. 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 So don't, don't tell your God how big your afflictions are. Tell your afflictions how big your God is. Amen. It is the same issue the disciples had. In the storm, Jesus didn't leave the boat. He was just taking a nap. The boat rocked him to sleep, but to them it was a storm. So many times we look at our trials and not our God. 
That's why Ellen White says in Desire of Ages, the Lord allowed the lightning to flash to remind them in their darkness that Jesus had not changed his location. Mm -hmm. They saw him sleeping and they woke him up, said, do you not care that we perish? It is those ridiculous questions that don't get an answer. He didn't say, of course I care. He says, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And you'll discover in those moments when your faith is challenged, it's your faith that's challenged, not your God. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's right. Psalm 3 3 says, You, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. Your head has to be downcast to be lifted. And I believe with all of my heart that God allows things to come into our life mm -hmm. for our eternal benefit. The worst year of my life I can look back on now and say was the best year of my life because this is when God taught me to return his word to him in prayer. And his word does not return void. He taught me the power of his word. And so I am now, I mean, God was, he cupped his hand under my chin and he lifted my face to look at him full-faced. And I now can look back on that horrible year of trial. It was a horrible year of illness. It was everything. But I look back and I say, thank you, Lord, for allowing that in my life because it taught me to be totally dependent upon him. But he also taught me truly that 2 Corinthians 1.20, all of his promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Yeah, amen. Ryan? Yeah, the, the Great Commission. What does Christ say? Lo, I am with you. Lo, I am with you always. Um, Christ is indeed in the heavenly sanctuary, mm -hmm. but he is omnipresent through the Spirit. Yes. And uh, I love the beautiful imagery that we have in Revelation chapter 5 where we see that, that baby lamb that appears before the throne slain. But the Bible says that uh, there you find the seven eyes within that lamb, which are the sp seven spirits of God that go throughout all of the world. So Christ is present through the, the omnipresent spirit, and he's with us. And so, uh, you know, the Bible says that the Father, well, we were told that the Father was with Christ while he was hanging on the cross suffering. You know, I have to believe that the Spirit of God was with his people when they were suffering through the Scripture. And so I believe that same thing for us. He is with us always. It is very difficult to, to just put a period in some of these things. I love Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. One, there is a reassurance that God will be our, our helper, that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And then it says we can boldly say God is our helper. So even in those tough times when it seems like you're alone, you can boldly state God is my helper. I'm not doing this alone. He is by my side. I have learned... In 2008 was a bad year for me, Shelley. I don't know what year was bad for you, but 2008 was bad for me. And I learned to praise Jesus for the problems I was having. Mm. And he gave me great comfort through that. Amen. Amen. And one last thing. Shelley, Shelley talked about this in the first hour of the program. That very question that was posed about why do bad things happen to good people, where is God when hurt comes, is what I'm addressing in the sermon, Coming with Clouds. Mm. Because we live in clouds, I'm not going to say any more. It's addressed in the sermon, Coming with Clouds. I encourage you to be here. But I want to give one more text in Revelation 3. Look at this text in Revelation chapter 3. And uh, verse 8. This was the message to the church of brotherly love. The church he had nothing negative to say about. Mm -hmm. Look what he says in verse 8. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. And look at this. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and here's the key, and have not denied my name. So often when trial come, trials come, Christians are the first to deny his name. Right. And when blessings come, they're the first ones to praise his name. We've got to decide we cannot be the fountain of bitter water in times of difficulty and sweet water in the times of prosperity. Yeah. Because the world is looking to us, our inconsistency will result in somebody's loss. Yeah. That's why Lot's wife was lost, his inconsistency. Mm -hmm. So we have to know that when difficulty comes, God wants us to reveal to the world in our difficulty that we serve a God greater than the God of this world. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. Where in heaven did Jesus live? Does Jesus live? Where in heaven does Jesus live? 
I'm not sure where he lives, but I know where he works. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and if we study D Daniel, we understand that his, his, his occupation now is in the sanctuary. He's pleading cases, looking at cases. We believe in a pre-advent judgment from Revelation 22. I'm coming and my reward is with me. That means it's already been decided who's going to get that reward. So he is taking care of business in his father's house even as we speak. Amen. Okay, well, this question, will we be keeping the Sabbath in heaven and the new earth? Absolutely. <laughs> Somebody, Somebody must have planted that one. <laughs> Isaiah 66, okay. verse 22 and 23. Don't you just love the way they know the verses right off the top of their head? I just, John gives me a, stare, a blank stare. Isaiah. And then he goes to the, the text. It's wonderful. Why are you in Psalm 12? <laughs> Isaiah 66, verse 22 and 23. I, We're getting old, man. That's the, Isaiah. Are you in Isaiah 12? Right there, what you're, the what you're doing? It's a, it's a All right, Isaiah 66, verse 23. <laughs> Speaking of the new earth, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is crackling. It shall come to pass from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. That's right. So that is, you know, when you think, I think it's Revelation 22 that says all will see his face in the new Jerusalem. I don't know about you, but I can't wait for face-to-face -face communication with the Lord. So when the new Jerusalem comes down to earth, we're going to have not only our home in the city, but Isaiah says we're going to go out and we're going to build places. We'll have a country home. We'll have a city home. We'll be coming into the new Jerusalem every Sabbath, anytime you want, with absolute access to God. But every Sabbath, we're going to have the most incredible worship service That's in the right. New Jerusalem. Amen. That's right. You know, she just, that, that, that verse that, that we just read in Isaiah 66 clearly tells us that we will be keeping Sabbath in heaven. I have ran across a lot of Christians who say, you know what, I have no problem keeping Sabbath in heaven, I just don't have to keep it right now on earth. Uh, we, we, we run into this quite often. But, uh, you know, the passage that comes to my mind that I love to bring up, and it's so simple, and that's the Lord's Prayer. When they ask him, Lord, teach us how to pray, what did he say? Uh, yeah, they've even made a song to him. Uh -huh. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And I love this next part. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. So we, we should be keeping it now as we will and as they are keeping it in heaven. I'll be glad when I get to heaven because I'll be able to sing. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Here's a confirmation scripture that is going to be kept in heaven. First Chronicles 17, 27. For you have blessed it, O Lord, and it shall be blessed forever. There's nothing wrong with the Sabbath. It was blessed in perfection. It will not be, it will not be eliminated in perfection. Mm -hmm. It was blessed in a perfect environment. It will not be deleted in the next perfect environment. Okay, next question. Is it important to attend church services? Is it important to attend church services? Hebrews 7.25. No, not 7. Is it? Wow. See, as, as young folks, see, what we would do is we would take a hashtag and put goals by that. See how you just knew to go to <laughs> Hebrews 7.25. Right. Hashtag goals. Yeah, I guess Forsaking it is. not the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but all the more. That's right. Now, Don't Hebrews forsake 7, the assembly. Now, 7.25 is he's able to save to the uttermost. It's, 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 it's not. Yeah, it's not 7.25. No? It, it's good to be anyway, 1025. 1025. Hebrews 1025. Okay, go ahead and read it. Oh. Oh, well, you quoted it right. You just had a, a reference wrong. Okay, praise God for that. <laughs> <laughs> Encouragement is the word. <laughs> 
Are you oh, going to read Not it? all jump in at once. Oh, yeah. Oh, I think we're trying to be kind to each other here. Not forsaking the assembling yes. of ourselves together as is the manner of son, but, <clears throat> son, but exhort one another and so much more as you see the day coming. You know, the reason that, well, first of all, why do we go to church? Why do we go to church? If, if we don't, I, I ask audiences sometimes and people will say, oh, to hear the word, to fellowship. All that and more. If we're not going to church to worship the Lord, yeah. we're not going to church for the right reason. We should be going to worship. But there is something about corporate worship and the fellowship yeah. that when we get together, you, you know, the, uh, Peter said that the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. When we were in South Africa, we saw a lion single out its prey. And what they do is if there's one that's not quite with the herd, then the lion starts circling it and they get them isolated. Mm. And that's when they take them down. The reason we should be going to church is because it buoys our faith. Amen. It builds us up. We go and worship with others, and you could maybe be having a down day. Somebody else can pray with you. But when you let Satan isolate you and keep you away from church, watch out. Because your enemy is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You've got two things, diaconia, which is a teaching, and koinonia, which is a fellowship. You need them both. If you're in a church that's all teaching and no fellowship, it's kind of dry. If you're a church that's all fellowship and no teaching, it's kind of dry. Yeah. That's right. So you, you need them both. You need spirit and truth. Absolutely. I just want to add to that, it, go back to our previous point we made earlier on earth as it is in heaven. We just read a text that says we're from one Sabbath to another. All flesh will come and worship before me, saith the Lord. So if we're going to be coming before God and worshiping him in heaven, then we should now. Why would we? <laughs> in Revelation 4, 8, we should take an example from the angels. You know, this is not a good question for me because I, I have a soapbox. People don't see it, but I have it. <laughs> I just don't know why people don't like to come to church. And I used to think it was me, but it's not. Because Elder Brooks said, sun melts butter and hardens clay. It's the condition of the human heart. Mm. I, I, I have taken off of my shoulder the burden that is maybe what I said. You know, somebody once said to me, I remember, matter of fact, it was Mike Tucker. We were down in uh, Texas at the pastor's meetings in 2015, and he said to me, John, are you staying out of trouble? I said, no, why should I? And he said, I said, well, the disciples are always in trouble. Jesus is always in trouble. <laughs> and he said that if you are, if you live a righteous life, you will suffer persecution. So why should I? He said, I like that. I'm going to preach that from now on. And here's the point. When you don't have a love that has to do more than with just a, a few hours in the day, the Sabbath is a day of fellowship. It's not a day of visitation. It's a day of fellowship. And sometimes we have the idea, it's amazing to me that Catholicism is pushing for the whole day of Sunday to be holy, and we find Adventists that are pushing for less of the day to be observed as holy. What better place should it be found among those except who say they keep the Sabbath? We should show the world how it should be kept. And the angels in Revelation 4, 8, there's a text here. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and listen to this, and they do not rest day nor night. The word there, rest, is the word for Sabbath. They do not rest day nor night, but what are they doing? They're worshiping God all the time. If you don't worship God during the week, then Sabbath is not going to be a substitute for what you don't do other days. Mm -hmm. Now, you're married, correct, Ryan? That's right. Shelly, you're married. Pastor Murray, you're married. Pastor Wilma Kang, you're married. And Bruce, you're married too, correct? That's correct. Okay. Are you? No, I feel singled out. Now, <laughs> now, will there be marriage in heaven? Yes. Uh, Amen. Yes. Now, can I add, 
You know, God is not going to say to Angie, drop John when you get to heaven. <laughs> Praise God, because my wife and I have a saying, come on, together, forever, eternity in view. Marriage was instituted before sin entered the world, just like the Sabbath. Okay. And since the Sabbath is eternal, so is marriage. We get mixed up. We're going to go to heaven for a thousand years. There won't be weddings there. You know why? We're going to heaven to address the final stage in the eradication of sin. But God is not going to say, sorry, CA. Irma don't want you anymore. No, there won't be weddings performed in heaven. That's what's being said. And I won't be giving, if you have a daughter, you won't be saying to somebody, you want to marry my daughter? Not during the thousand years in heaven. Marriage will not be annulled in heaven any more than the Sabbath. Well, I better get married before I go then. <laughs> <laughs> he got it. He heard you, Pastor. <laughs> you had something, Ryan? Yeah, you know, I just, I, I like what, I, I like Pastor Doug's response to this. He says, I just can't, I can't picture Jesus handing out divorce slips, you know, as we're walking through the pearly gates, you know, to all of the couples, you know, and I can't see that either. Um, you know, I go back to the idea that, you know, I, we are told in, in inspiration and even in the Bible that just as God began the scripture, as we see there, where God creates a beautiful, perfect atmosphere before sin ever entered the picture, what did God establish in the Garden of Eden? Two things, marriage, marriage and the Sabbath. Okay, so, you know, who... You know, I don't see any evidence where we see that God is going to reverse that or get rid of it. I think that it's going to continue on, and I'm going to look forward to living with my sweetheart in my mansion. And you, you, you just won some points. <laughs> well, well, technically we'll have two mansions, so we'll just go back and forth, right? She'll have a mansion, I'll have a mansion? Well, and we'll all go back and forth all, at the same time. Right, same, same time. Same mansion, same time. Same, same mansion, same time. <laughs> okay. All marriages in heaven will be happy marriages. Amen. Amen. That's right, brother. That's right. Sometimes some of us are burdened with an unhappy marriage, mm. not myself. Right. But when you get to heaven, your, ha your marriage will be happy. That's right. You'll be have a wonderful marriage. Okay. Who is Michael? Is he Christ? Hmm. Prove it from the Bible. Okay. Who is Michael? Is he Christ? Prove it from the Bible. Text and verse. Yeah. I would like to um, start in Exodus chapter 3, if I can get there. In Exodus chapter 3, we see a conversation happening between Moses and this, what appears to be, it says an angel of the Lord, but we're told later that it is none other than God himself speaking from this bush. And of course, uh, in this same passage, and I'm trying to find the specific verse, but if you look here in chapter 3, it tells uh, the, the bush, uh, the person speaking from the bush tells Moses, take off your sandals for where you are standing is holy ground. holy ground. And we know that the presence of God makes that holy ground. We know that he was speaking to God. I'm trying to find that specific verse here. Let's see if I can, uh, yeah, right here, verse 5. And he said, uh, do not draw near to this place, take off your sandals. Take off the sandals from your feet for where the place where you stand is holy ground. Now we find the same thing happening in Joshua chapter 5. If you go over to Joshua chapter 5, and you said to prove it from the Bible, so I'm going to give my take on it. And then pastors, feel free to, and Shelly, uh, feel free to jump in here. Uh, Joshua chapter 5, we have an interesting scene happening uh, between Joshua and this, uh, this interesting character that shows up with his sword drawn. And he tells him, uh, let me see if I can find it here. While he's looking for it, I say that respectfully. While he's looking for it, you find three confirming scriptures in the Bible that are unequivocal. Mm -hmm. Who else can stand in behalf of his people during the time of trouble other than Christ? At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which stands for the children of thy people. Mm -hmm. There shall be a time of trouble. Michael there in the Hebrew as well as in the Greek, means one who is like God. And there's no one else. Another one, Jude, yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil. Who can contend over the body of Moses other than the one who owns the body of Moses? And then, Revelation, Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. Who could fight against the devil 
other than Christ. And then, voice of the archangel, who is that? The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. That's right. The one who is above the angels. That is Christ, and his name is Michael. Revelation, um, can Daniel 10, and I'm at verse 13, about halfway through. The Bible says, Michael, one who is like God. And, and, mm -hmm. and that means one who exercises the same authority as God. The one thing we know about Michael, in Revelation 19, when, when John fell to worship, that being the angel said, see that thou do it not. Because angels don't accept worship. The only one that is worthy to be worshipped, the only one who accepts worship, is, is Michael. So that says that he is a being to be worshipped. That means he is God. Amen. That's right. You, you found that? Well, I was just going to make the connection right here in Joshua chapter 5, uh, where in the latter verses, verse 13 through 15, we see that uh, Joshua is having this encounter with uh, this individual who identifies himself as the commander of the army of the Lord. So we know that Michael, the archangel, the archangel in the original Greek is simply the word uh, archangelos, which simply means chief of the angels. So he's not a, a normal angel. Uh, the original word for angel is angelos, which is just simply messenger. But the chief of the messengers, the chief of the angels is Michael. Now in Exodus 3, the same individual that says, take off your sandals for where you stand is holy ground. The same individual refers to himself as the great I am. Where, who do I tell them that you are? I am that I am. This same character in Joshua it tells Joshua to take off his sandals for where he stands as holy ground. So this is no normal angel. This is a holy individual. And we know that Christ, and I believe it's John chapter 8 or John chapter 10, where he refers to himself as the I am when he says before Abraham was, I am. And of course, as pastor brought out, we are told in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, I believe it is, that Christ is coming back with the voice of of the archangel. So there's no doubt that he is Michael the archangel. And in the Hebrew, the, the term I am, using a present tense like that, is an indication that the person speaking is calling himself or naming himself God. Mm -hmm. And we know that the angel of the covenant uh, in Exodus was Christ Jesus himself. See, we get... Uh, I think we get confused because we think of angel as being a created being. And the ministering spirits are created beings. Right. But angel means messenger. I mean, the angels are messengers of God. Right. And we're not the only, by the way, we're not the only denomination or church that believes that Ang Michael is Jesus Christ. There's many, many Bible scholars who agree on that. Well, I think you guys gave ample biblical proof um, in, in answer to that question. Uh, so this one is a, a two-part question. Is it true we are saved by grace, but works is mixed in there somewhere? So if we are saved by grace, are we judged by our works? Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says that we are saved by grace through faith, not by works that we should boast. But... And then 10 backs it right up, yes, that we are created for the good works that God prepared in advance for us to do. In Romans 6.16, the Bible says that, or Paul says, that we are slaves to whom we obey. We're either slaves to righteousness or we're slaves of sin. In 1 John 2, 3, and 4, it says that if anyone says he knows him, he knows Jesus Christ, yet does not keep the commandments, he is a liar and the truth is not in him. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 5, 9 says that Jesus Christ is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Mm -hmm. So when you think about, you know, people get so upset when we talk about obedience, but obedience is by grace because Philippians 2, 12 and 13 says he, he works in us. It is God who works in us to will and to do his good pleasure. So we are saved. A salvation belongs to God alone, mm -hmm. but the Bible says that our rewards will follow them. Yes, we are are going to have our rewards because 
of our obedience. We don't obey to be saved. We obey because we are saved. And one more point. The Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20 are written in the future tense. This means they were promises. God is saying to us that if we're in covenant relationship with him, we're not going to have any gods before him. We're not going to bow down to idols. We're not going to take his name. We're going to be so excited to worship on the Sabbath with him. We won't. We will uh, honor our parents. We won't commit murder, adultery. We won't steal. We won't bear false testimony. We won't covet. Why? Because that's what living in covenant relationship with him is all about. He came to save us from our sin. Amen. Go ahead, Summarize John. It, sure. Works is not what gets us saved. Works is what shows up when we are saved. That's right. It's the evidence of, the, of our salvation, not the method of our salvation. I used to think I had to keep the commandments. Now, I feel I get to keep the commandments. I don't have to. I get to. They're a privilege, a privilege to keep the commandments. That's right. And Amen. forgiveness is available when I mess up. All right, panel. How do you know God's will for your life? How do you know God's will for your life? Oops. I don't need to. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I don't need say. to know God's will for my life. That's the, you know, one of the things that, go to, go to, go to uh, Philippians. Go to Philippians with me. I don't need to know God's will for my life. That's one of the questions we ask when, in fact, we couldn't even accomplish God's will if we knew it. How many of you could accomplish it? <laughs> for it is God who works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Paul made it very clear. Some people use that almost as a hindrance to doing anything. Well, what of God's will for my life is. Get up and do something, and God will work out his will in your life. You can't, you can't say, I wonder which way to go, and you're sitting in your car without the engine turning on. The will of God is appointed. Let's just go ahead and make it clear here. In Philippians, here I am, 2. Look at this, Philippians 2.12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not also in my presence only, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's often what people see. Verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his, of his good pleasure. We cannot do God's will. God does his will through us. Right. We are the vessel out of which he works. We don't work to become his vessel. We become his vessel and he works through us. Ooh, but I do have a scripture. First Thessalonians 4 verse 3 says, this is the will of God for your life, and that is your sanctification. See, we are justified by the blood of Jesus Christ, right? We're forgiven of those past sins, but God's will for our life is that we walk just as Jesus walked on the earth, that we walk in the narrow path, that we Walk in the path of his life where we will see pleasures at his right hand forevermore. So God's will for our life is simply that we yield to the Holy Spirit and he will work in us to will and to do the good, his good pleasure. And Philippians 1, 6 says that he will complete the good work he's begun. Amen. Okay, now we only have a few minutes left, so we have to, we have to get through these next couple questions rather quickly. Um, one person said, I am anxious all the time. Can I really trust in Jesus? Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16. Paul writes these beautiful doctrinal theses, but he, he couches them in some poetic language all through the book of 1 Thessalonians. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation, which are two words I just love. Um, we can have everlasting consolation uh, and good hope by grace 
comfort your heart and establish you in every good word and work. So consolation is promised. Comfort is promised. A settling in and establishment is promised. Good words, good work follow from that. So be anxious for nothing. He wants to establish you, to comfort you, and to console you even in troublous times. Amen. What do you have, Ryan? Yeah, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Mm -hmm. Trust in the Lord with all your heart mm -hmm. and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Person who's anxious, perhaps maybe suffering from anxiety or whatever that might be, you know, God just wants us to trust him. I think that's what this entire book is about. Amen. From cover to cover, God is pleading with his children, with his creation, to trust him. Mm -hmm. And I think if we do that, uh, while the devil may throw his fiery darts at us, we know that God is in control. And Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. So as we, when I feel myself getting anxious, I realize I've got my eyes on the problem, not on the problem solver. Amen. So I return, you know, I have to say, Lord, help me keep my eyes focused on you. Oh, increase my trust, Lord. Let me not lean on my own understanding. Sure, sure. And, you know, he will bring that peace that transcends all understanding. We've got about a minute left. If you can't trust God, who can you trust? Amen. I, and you know what? I think that God has given us ample proof in his word of why we should trust him. That's right. You know, Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins while we were yet sinners. He came and died for us. And Thanks. he is the same today, yesterday, and forever. So we know that what we see here is the way he still is. Amen. The answers the panel provided tonight shows we can trust God. That God's word shows we can trust him. Absolutely. Absolutely. Man, I wish we had more time because, you know, what I would love to ask you guys, the, the, all of you that speak, how do you prepare your sermons? Well, maybe we, can, maybe we can ask that at another time, because I think that's a deep question that's going to require quite a while to answer. Here's the answer. We just trust God. There you go. <laughs> All right. We well, trust God. Yeah, there's the cliff notes. <laughs> that's right. That's very good. Well, thank you guys so much for, for answering these Bible questions, and I hope that everybody's questions were answered, and we are in store for a blessing with Pastor Ty Gibson. Amen.